for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. Sunday morning, May the 24th, 1987. Memorial Weekend, Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Norman Parrish of Guatemala is the speaker of the morning. I'm going to get into the work. And we're going to open again in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Friday, Saturday, we have uh, studied ch uh, Acts chapter 8, but I don't think I'm quite finished with this passage of Scripture. I think there's some other things that God wants to bring to our attention that will be a practical value to those of us that are gathered here in this church building this morning. So let's read again in Acts chapter 8. I think it would be fitting to read this passage over again for the benefit of those that perhaps weren't here Friday or Saturday. We're going to read beginning in verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money shall perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thoughts, the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then I answered Simon, and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now, Friday and Saturday we talked extensively about this passage of Scripture. This is one of the great revivals that took place in the first century uh, during what has been called the early church period. Uh, the Lord, in His plan for world evangelization, had included the city and the province of Samaria. He had a special love for the Samaritans because they were benighted. They were ostracized. They were people that had been looked down upon for many years and for, or for several centuries. And, and when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he, he laid out the, uh, the systematic plan of world evangelization, said, begin at Jerusalem, cover all Judea, but don't forget Samaria. Now, I already mentioned that Samaria was overlooked. The disciples neglected to go to Samaria. And I believe it was out of uh, racial prejudice or racial bigotry. Uh, the, the people that were of Jewish extraction had no dealings with the Samaritans. There was no love between these two races. Uh, there was a constant animosity. There was a constant hatred displayed. Jews would 
do everything they could to avoid uh, having to even talk with the Samaritans. But you know, uh, the Bible says that God loved the whole world. And there's not a people anywhere in the world that God has not included in his plan of salvation. So God permitted a series of fortuitous circumstances. Persecution broke up, and the believers were scattered. They were forced to flee, and some of them went uh, into uh, neighboring countries with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But one man in particular, Philip, who was just an ordinary Christian, a layman, who had been appointed, had been elected to be one of the first deacons of the church of Jerusalem, he was sent by the Spirit to Samaria. Now, the Bible says here that he went down to Samaria. And you know, I believe that there is a literal and also a spiritual meaning to every passage of Scripture. He went down, that means that he had to go down geographically. Jerusalem was at a higher elevation than Samaria. Uh, So he had to go down geographically. He had to go down several hundreds or several thousand of feet down to where Samaria was located. But I believe there is also a spiritual application. He had to go down. That means he had to come off of his pedestal out of that high and lofty position that he felt he had as a member of God's chosen uh, people, as a Jew. And he had to humble himself in order to go and minister to the people of Samaria. One of the things I've discovered, brethren, as I've served Christ on the mission field is that unless you're able to get down to the people's level, you will never be able to help them. A lot of missionaries, they come with their... American ideas, and they live in the better class neighborhoods. They rent or buy houses where the, where the, in the, area, uh, where the wealthy people live, and uh, they never associate with uh, the people, what we would call the down and outers, with the poor people. In fact, you know, uh, and this is sad to say, many missionaries won't even let their children play with the natives. I know missionaries that their children never learn to even speak the language or the dialect of the people. They live, live a sheltered life. They either have homeschooling or they send their kids off to a missionary uh, children's school. And they're protected from having any relationship with the natives. They don't want their kids to get contaminated. And they don't want their kids naturally to intermarry with the, with the locals. And so uh, the ministry of these type of missionaries is minimized. There's not much they can do. I believe, brethren, that if we want to minister to a certain kind of people, we're going to have to go down, get down where they live and where they hurt, identify with their needs, build bridges, feel a certain rapport or a certain identity with the people we are trying to minister to. You cannot minister by remote control. You have to get close to people. And I was in Africa last year. I went to Kenya Uganda. I was invited to speak at a large minister's conference in Uganda. There's about a thousand black ministers from Uganda and some of the neighboring countries. Uh, There was a team that came out of the West Coast, out of Arizona, out of California, that uh, traveled there. I don't know how they included me. I got a letter of invitation to go and uh, be a part of this ministry. Uh, I only knew one of the men. But when I got there, I discovered that these men tried to avoid any contact with the natives. I don't know if it was fear of AIDS or what, but they would arrive at the meeting place after the service started, and they would leave the meeting place before the service ended. Um, they were they rushed in and out, and uh, I would drag my feet. I'd let them go and get in the car, and uh, I'd mingle amongst, around the people, and I'd hug necks, and, and I had a great time. I just loved those black people. I I discovered I could love them as much as I love my Spanish-speaking people, you know. And uh, uh, I I don't understand how how anybody can be a missionary or be an evangelist and not get close to people. Uh, Feel feel what they feel. Uh, Philip had to go down. He had to come off his uh, exalted position. You know, a lot of people of a Jewish extraction, even today, are high polluting, you know, they, they just think they're superior, and, and, and this is, I hope no one will take it as a, as a, a racial sli- as a slight or, or a slap on the, in the face, but this is, this is obvious when you, you deal with them, and, and brethren, 
I've discovered that we as Christians cannot assume an attitude like this. Americans, because they come from the greatest nation in the world, the most powerful nation, the most wealthy nation, so they say, uh, <laughs> many times go with this attitude to, uh, to the mission field. And uh, the natives can pick that up, just like that. Uh, you don't have to do or say anything. Uh, it, yeah, it's a spirit, I think, that people immediately discern. And, uh, and your effectiveness as a servant of God is, uh, is destroyed. And a lot of those uh, missionaries that have come with uh, that pretense or with that attitude are rejected by the natives. And before long, they have to leave the mission field broken and uh, defeated because they were not willing to humble themselves, lower themselves to the level of the people that God sent them to minister to. Okay? Now, another thing I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture is that it can be found here in uh, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. You know, I'm just giving you little pointers. Uh, these are little helpful hints that my God might use in the future in your own life and ministry. Uh, there are many here that perhaps uh, uh, head up prayer groups or, or pastor local churches. But one of the things you're going to have to establish if you want to lead people to Christ is you have to establish credibility in the community where you're living and where you're working. Amen. People have to learn, be able to trust you. They have to be able to, con to have confidence in you as a person. It says here that they believe Philip. It didn't say that they believe Christ. They believe Philip. Uh, and when they, were, when they believed Philip, then they were willing and ready to also believe in the Christ that Philip was presenting. Amen? Now, in order to build credibility, we have to be people of integrity and people of honesty. We have to fulfill our commitments. We have to pay our bills. Uh, people in the community must be convinced that we are truly Christian people. Amen? And that's uh, something that takes time. Uh, credibility is only built up over a period of months and perhaps years. And uh, I've gone to many communities uh, and I've discovered that people that are in ministry that have prayer groups and have uh, deliverance groups don't have a very good reputation around town. Huh? Perhaps they've been careless, they've been slack in doing some of the things that people normally expect of a... Of, a, of an honest person. We have to good, be good parents. We have to be good citizens before people will believe in us. If they don't believe in us, they won't believe the message that we're preaching, no matter how eloquent, no matter how beautiful it might be. So this is something, this is just a word of advice that I'm giving this morning. If you want to be used of God in some ministry, in some place, the first thing you have to do is establish credibility. People have got to see that you are living according to your convictions. Huh? That you're not a hypocrite. That you're not an imposter. That you are what you claim to be. They believe Philip. And when they believe Philip, then it was easy for them to believe in Christ Jesus. It was easy for them to believe the gospel. And they were converted and baptized, etc., etc., because Philip was a man that established his credibility. Um, he was a man of true Christian character. Amen? Okay, we're studying just a few things out of this passage before I get in the main part of the message. Now, Philip was a great man. How many believe that? Amen. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't one of the, of the big names in the early church. But there, he was a, a man that was truly anointed and used of God. You notice, uh, as we've studied this passage of Scripture, that in a matter of a few weeks, he was able to lead the people in, to, to, of Samaria into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They were converted, they were baptized, they were healed, they were delivered. Uh, he, 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 he broke the power of darkness over that city. His influence was so great that people that were steeped in spiritualism, that practiced magic and divination and sorcery, uh, were converted to the point that Simon lost his profitable business. Uh, he he was run out was run out of business. He lost his clientele. Uh, he, he lost uh, his customers. People just didn't rally around him. People just didn't come and look for his help and his advice 
as they used to in the past. But in spite of the fact that Philip was a man of faith, a man of wisdom, a man of, that had a tremendous anointing on his life, he was sadly lacking in certain areas of experience in ministry. And we're going to see that this morning. Uh, this, this will come to prove that no one is sufficient in himself. One thing I've had to learn and learn the hard way is that I don't have it all cornered. I don't know everything. I don't have everything. Uh, there are certain things that I sadly lack. And I have to avail myself of other ministries in order to be able to fulfill the task that God has given me. I have to su supplement or complement uh, what God has given me uh, with what God has given other people. See, God, God has raised what we call a body minister. There must be an interdependency. I, I believe, brethren, that the day of the Lone Rangers is over. Amen. You know? There's a lot of people running around the country that are unsubmitted. They don't recognize any spiritual authority. And they're going here and going there, and they're causing more trouble and creating more uh, strife than, than anything else. I believe Philip was a humble man that knew spiritual authority and respected spiritual authority. The Bible says here, just notice in chapter 8, in uh, verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles which were Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent now, how did the apostles of Jerusalem hear that Samaria had received the word of God? Uh, uh, Philip must have sent in a report. He must have sent someone to go and tell what God was doing in the city of Samaria. Because he recognized the authority and the leadership of the apostles that were at Jerusalem. Now, there has been a great emphasis in the body of Christ on authority and submission. And probably it has been overworked. It's been abused. Uh, and, and we have seen this happen in this shepherding discipleship movement that lately, over the last year or so, has uh, suffered some radical changes. But listen, brethren, I don't believe on unilateral dis uh, submission. I believe in mutual submission. Let me illustrate this. Uh, on the mission field in the nine countries where we work, I'm recognized as the spiritual leader. But I'm not a dictator and I'm not a despot. I have never tried to force my authority over any of the workers or any of the believers. I think spiritual authority flows smoothly. It doesn't have to be coerced. It doesn't have to be enforced. Spiritual authority is recognized. Uh, is recognized. So, on an individual basis, I could truly say that the pastors, workers that are part of our ministry submit to me on an individual basis. But on a corporate basis, I submit to them. Uh, we have, we have uh, what we have called in, in American terms, we have boards. In every country, uh, we, have, we have organized the work according to New Testament principles. And the ministries that are, have been proven, have proven themselves, the more mature ministries, the more uh, experienced ministries, come together occasionally and they have uh, two, three days fellowship and prayer, and then they discuss uh, the needs and the problems of the work. They, have, you, you, they get down to business, if you want to use that term. Now, I go to every one of these countries and meet with the leaders, but when I go, immediately I submit to the local leadership. Uh, I do that here at Lake Hamilton. Since the moment I arrive in Lake Hamilton, I submit to Brother Glenn uh, and, the, and the others that are in authority here. Uh, if someone comes and says, will you pray for me? I first tell them that they've got to check it out with Brother Glenn and see if he agrees uh, that I would minister to them in private. That happened yesterday. Uh, yes, uh, also a brother that's a friend and a, and a supporter of our ministry. And when he arrived, he said, Brother Parrish, I want you to baptize me while I'm here. And I said, I cannot do that unless Brother Glenn agrees and authorizes. I said, you go and talk with Brother Glenn. And so... Brother Glenn has agreed uh, and announced that I'm going to help with the baptisms this afternoon. Amen? Because I believe that we are called to submit to those that are in spiritual authority. And I tell you, there's such peace and there's such relief when you do this. Amen. See, that's the answer to rebellion. I don't, I'm not loose and fancy free. I'm not traveling over this country disengaged. Uh, everywhere I go, I submit to the local ministry. And I do that on the mission field. When I go to Columbia, I submit to the local leaders. When I go to Honduras, I submit to the local leaders. Although they respect me and look to me as the spiritual leader over the work in 
in general, I'm uh, recognized as general director or general overseer, yet individually I submit that I go to a local church, maybe a little church in the jungles, a little thatch roof building, dirt floors, not in, might not even have any walls, might not even have any pews. There's just a couple handfuls of people that meet there. But the moment I arrive, I submit to that perhaps barefooted native pastor. He might not be able to speak even Spanish well. Uh, he's uneducated. He might not even know how to read or write. He might not even be able to sign his own name. There are cases like that on the mission field. But the moment I arrive, I say, Brother, I'm here to help you. I'm here to do whatever you feel is best for the, to, to the best interest of this work. If he says, sit down, and I sit down, and uh, I just, I'll just listen and just rejoice in what others are doing. I don't think that when I come to one of our churches or one of our conventions that I have to be out in front, you know, making a spectacle of myself. If I can come and sit and enjoy the presence and the blessing of God. Yeah, I believe in submission. I don't know if you do, but there's a lot of people in charismatic circles and deliverance circles in kingdom circles that don't believe in submission. They've got this attitude, just Jesus and me, you know. I submit to God, but I don't recognize anybody in the flesh. Well, I believe in delegated authority. I believe that God delegates his authority to men that have proven themselves through the years. And it's my duty and my privilege to submit to them. And I believe that Philip was a man that had learned the lesson of submission, so that when God began to bless and began to move in Samaria, he sent a report into the apostles, and the apostles took certain measures that were beneficial to the work in Samaria. They, the apostles met and they elected Peter and John to go down to Samaria to minister the Holy Spirit to these new believers. Now, did you notice something there? Even Peter had learned to submit. Peter didn't boss the church. The church bossed Peter. You know, we said that Peter it was the first pope. Now, I don't say that, but the Catholic Church does. Uh, they say that Peter was the first pope. Now, if he was the first pope, he, was, he would not have to submit to anybody. He was not accountable to anybody. But here it says that when the apostles heard that Samaria had received the, the word of God, they met and they chose and they sent Peter and John so that they would go. Peter was submitted to the, to the rest of the apostles. And if Peter had learned to submit, uh, certainly you and I, who are little, uh, what, would I, what would I call, little nobodies, uh, should learn to submit. Amen? You know, one of the great mistakes that Paul the Apostle did was to not submit to those that were in authority in the body of Christ. How many read that story? It's in chapter 20, chapter 21. Of, of, the, of this same book, the book of Acts. See, Peter, uh, let's just turn there quickly. And, uh, because I think this is an important and invaluable lesson we have to learn. Here in uh, Acts chapter 19, let me see if I can find it. Yes, in 1921, after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Now, this was an act of his own self-free will. He purposed, he determined to go to Jerusalem. He didn't ask for advice. He didn't ask for confirmation. He just said, I'm going to Jerusalem. So he started out in that direction. On his way to Jerusalem, he had to go through several countries and several cities. And the Holy Spirit began to warn him that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Uh, here in chapter 20, let me see if I find another verse that I'm, uh, I'm using a new Bible that was donated to me. So I don't have any markings on it. But in 2016 it says, For Paul had determined, once again we see Paul exercising his own will. He purposed, he determined. Uh, so everywhere he went, the Holy Spirit began to warn him. He even, he, he, only, he even confesses to that here in chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit on, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, Say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me there. Now, the Holy Spirit began to warn him that if he went up to Jerusalem, he was in for trouble. He was going to be afflicted and he was going to be bound. But Paul disregarded probably these prophecies. He even says here, I bound in the Spirit go up to Jerusalem. 
Now, let me ask you something this morning, brethren. Who was binding Paul? What spirit was binding Paul? Now, he felt constrained. There was compulsory behavior. He felt obligated. He felt constrained to go up to Jerusalem. There was something that was binding him in his spirit that was forcing him to go uh, up to Jerusalem in spite of advice, in spite of warning. Was this the Holy Spirit that was binding him? A lot of people say yes. But I'm convinced, after studying and restudying this passage many times, that it was not the Holy Spirit, but it was an evil spirit that was influencing Paul. How do I know? Well, in chapter 21, chapter 21, it says that he arrived uh, in the city of Tyre, verse 4, in finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Now it's not a warning, now it's a prohibition. Paul, don't go, period. I think this was just as plain and just as obvious as anything. Don't go. Do you think God contradicts himself? Do you think the Holy Spirit is impelling Paul to go and, and then all along during the journey everywhere he's warning and he's forbidding him to go? I think Paul was, was well, he was bullheaded. <laughs> he was very, he was stiff-necked. He had to be. He was a strong character. I mean, he was, he, he was many times very adamant and very purposeful in what he did. I don't think he would have gotten very far in, in the first century ministering the gospel in different cities and different areas if it hadn't been for that strong will. But he hadn't learned the lesson of submission. So he gets up to Caesarea here in chapter 21, verse uh, 28. It says, he came unto Caesarea. And while he was there in Philip's house, uh, a prophet, the, the, I think he was the best prophet. <laughs> uh, he was at least a, he, he was an, a recognized prophetic voice in the early church. Agabus came down from Jerusalem. And he gave Paul an object lesson. Do you remember what happened? Verse 11. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, or Paul's belt, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owneth, or that owneth, this girdle, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Agabus, by the Spirit, was, Paul was not going to regard or obey any kind of advice. He said, when you get to Jerusalem, they're going to bind, bind you hand and foot, and they're going to turn you into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, the others who were present, uh, the, the believers of the church at Caesarea, and the ministers that travel with Paul, his companions in ministry, they, according to the next verse, it says, And when we heard these things, both we, that's Luke and his and the other fellow ministers, and they that of that place, the church at Caesarea, besought him, begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. They understood the message. But Paul was, by then, was perhaps a little befuddled, a little confused. He was spiritually deaf. You know, and when, when they begged him, don't go up, Paul. It's dangerous. You're going to lose your liberty. You're going to lose your life. What did he say? I think he was boasting. He said in verse 13, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. He said, I've suffered so much that <laughs> a few more stones and a, a few more strikes uh, won't bother me. Now, I'm really to not only suffer, but die. Now, let me ask you, did he, did he prove this to be true with time? L listen to this. When Paul was incarcerated, first in Jerusalem, then in Caesarea, there was a plot against him. Remember, certain men made a vow that they wouldn't eat bread or drink water until they had killed Paul. A close relative, Paul's close relative, I think it was his sister, or got wind of this. And she sent her son to the prison house to inform Paul that these men were out to get him. I mean, they were going to slaughter him. And they had it all planned. They were going to have the magistrate take Paul out and exhibit him and uh, maybe interrogate him. And then they were going to jump him and kill him. So what did Paul do? Did he say, oh, uh, I don't care. No, I've committed my life to God. Uh, if, they, if they want to torture me, fine. If they want to kill me, fine. What did he say? Uh, he got a little preoccupied. And he, he, he called those that were in authority, and, and, and the gist of the story is that he appealed to whom? To Caesar. He put himself under the protection of Caesar. And who was Caesar? Who was Caesar? 
Caesar was Satan. I have no doubt in, in, in saying that. Because all these ancient kings and all these ancient emperors were motivated by evil spirits. When you read about Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, you, you'll find out if you, if you study other passages of Scripture. Just let's go to Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 3. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. Who was Pharaoh? He was the embodiment of the great dragon. Who is the great dragon? Satan. And if you read about the king of Tyre and the prince of Tyre, you'll find that the prince was a man, but the king was a spirit that dwelt and dwelt the man, that motivated the man. And I'm convinced, brethren, that the ruler, especially of these heathen nations, are demon-possessed. And there are evil spirits that are operating through them and that control them and influence them in all their decisions. And here Paul, perhaps out of fear, suddenly after a few weeks or months in jail, fear uh, overtook him. And he said, I appealed to Caesar. He put himself under the protection of the Roman government. And we know what happened then. Had Paul learned to submit? Had Paul learned to submit? He didn't know how to submit to the Holy Spirit. He didn't know how to submit to ministries on the par. You know, ministers like Agabus and like Philip. He didn't know how to submit to his fellow travelers or fellow companions in ministry. He didn't know how to submit to the local church. But listen to this. This might astonish some of you. When he got up to Jerusalem, according to chapter 21, he immediately went and met with uh, the pastor of the, of the church of Jerusalem. Who was he? James. He was the head elder. He was the pastor. And uh, here you can see that uh, in, in chapter 21, verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. Now, you remember that James and these elders representing, represented what has been called the Judaizers. It was the, it was the, the Jewish uh, sector of the church at Jerusalem. They believed that Christians, uh, Gentile Christians that converted to the gospel should keep the Sabbath and should keep the law. James and these elders were Judaizers. And what did Paul do? These Judaizers got together and said, Now, Paul, you're in trouble. Everybody here knows what you've done. There are rumors around town that you've told the Gentile believers, the Jewish believers, and even Gentile believers to disregard the law, to break the Sabbath. And they said, you better do something to, uh, to gain their favor, you know. And you've got to cover up. And so they said, there's some men that have made a vow that they've shaved their head and they're going to the church, the temple, and they're going to offer sacrifices for their sins. And we would advise you to join them. And Paul did that. He went down to the temple of Jerusalem, made a vow, shaved his hair, and paid homage and offered sacrifice. What was he doing? He was reverting to what? Judaism. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and in verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul was building up the Jewish faith. By his example, he was inviting people to submit to rituals and to laws that he himself had declared during his public ministry that, that were no lo have no longer applied to us as Christians. He was building up the things that he destroyed. Now, what, what is the lesson that we have to learn from this? Listen, if you don't submit to true spiritual authority, you're going to end up submitting to false spiritual authority. You're going to submit to somebody. And a lot of people will not submit to true spiritual authority. And then they end up in cults. And they'll end up in sex. They end up under the influence and even control of people that are not genuinely uh, called of God. I know this because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen over and over again. Rebels, uh, that, people that rebel against true spiritual authority, sooner or later come under domination of some false ministry that will control them and will exploit them and, and will abuse them, will take advantage of them, will strip them of their faith and strip them of their money and strip them of everything. This has happened over and over again. See, Paul would not submit to true spiritual authority. He would not submit to the Holy Spirit he would not submit to Agabus, to Philip, to Luke, to his fellow ministers, to the believers at the church in Caesarea, but he ended, he ended up 
submitting to James and the elders of the church of Jerusalem that were Judaized. And that suggests that he revert to the law and that he make oaths and that he make sacrifices. And that was his undoing. Because it was right in the Jewish temple that he fell into the hands of his enemies. And he never recovered his freedom as far as we can tell by the Bible. Now there's, there's uh, uh, church history or church tradition says that Paul was released and then he was uh, re-imprisoned. I don't think you can prove that. But now, God's will was that Paul go to Rome. Was it or wasn't it? Paul knew it. But I don't think it was God's will for Paul to go to Rome bound in chains. When he got to Rome, his ministry was uh, hardly, uh, it hardly made a ripple in the city of Rome. Because he was in a, in a house and only a few people were authorized to come and see him. He could speak the principles of the kingdom of God just to a handful of people that had the courage to go and visit him. Paul could have had a great ministry in Rome if he had heeded the advice of his peers. And I know there are people here, if God had me speak about this this morning, is because there are people here that are running around the country from one church to another church, from one camp to another church, that are totally unsubmitted. And they're proud that they're unsubmitted. They think that's the height of spirituality, to be unsubmitted. And they, they look down their nose on people that submit to spiritual authority. They want to be free. But, brethren, if you don't submit to true spiritual authority, you're going to end up submitting to wrong spiritual authority. Amen. And it's going to be a sad experience. I've seen a lot of people devastated by this experience. There was a missionary in Guatemala that rebelled against uh, <laughs> the authority that God had placed in the work in Guatemala. He came home and he went to Oklahoma City and he fell into uh, the hands of people that believed in uh, this extreme shepherding teaching. And for five years they had him sick. He had a call. He had anointed him. I mean, he was a good man. The only problem is that he was a rebel. So they had him sit for five years. He didn't open his mouth to even say peep. I mean, they didn't let him share. They didn't let him minister for five years. He ended up cleaning smokestacks, cleaning uh, chimneys. It took five years. I think God permitted that to break him, <laughs> to humble him, because I saw him just a few months back, and he's a changed man. But he could have spared himself such a painful experience by what? By learning to submit to spiritual authority. Now, you'll never find a man that is perfect. You're always going to find something wrong with his doctrine or something wrong with his, uh, uh, with his home or something wrong with his personality. If you're looking for the perfect person you can submit to, you're going to have to wait till, <laughs> till you're uh, face to face with Jesus. Hmm? But God will direct you. If you're honest and sincere, God's going to direct you to men that can help you, that can dis discipline you. That, you know, God wants to raise up men and women today that uh, have learned the lesson of submission. Yes. Submission is not subjugation. Man that has true spiritual authority is not going to subjugate you and is not going to exploit you. Amen. There's going to be a respect even for you, for your opinion, for your will. But I tell you that since I learned this lesson, I've come into peace. I've come into peace. And I, I, could, I came to Lake Hamilton with no assurances that I was going to minister. And I... I Came with a, I, I'm here to receive, not to give. If Brother Glenn and Sister Irma would have just ignored me, I would have been just as happy. Please turn the tape over for side two. Thank you. This has gone out of me. Uh, I appreciate a few days when I don't have to even do anything. And it's not very often. When I was younger, I was highly incensed and offended if I was ignored. You know, I, I thought I was the great man of faith and power and everybody had to take me into consideration. You know, they had to give me preference uh, when it came to ministry. But that's, that's come to an end. I've learned to submit. I believe in mutual submission. The Bible says, submit yourself one to another. It's not that pyramid, pyramid scheme where everybody submits to one man. Where there's no place for popish authority in the body of Christ. Uh, but there's place for true spiritual authority. I hope and pray that God will give you an understanding of this. An understanding of Okay? Let's go back to Acts. How many still want to study the Word? Do you think this is profitable? Okay. Now, I said that Philip was a great man. 
He was humble. He was submissive. But he lacked. He lacked certain things. The first thing he lacked, I'm going to share with you, is he lacked spiritual discernment. He lacked spiritual discernment. You remember that character called Simon? Magician, sorcerer? When he saw that he was losing his influence over the people of Samaria, what did he do? If you can't beat them, join them. So he decided to jump on the bandwagon and become a Christian. And you'll notice here in verse 12, it says, I mean, in verse 13, Then Simon himself believed also. I believe, I, I can't explain, I'm not very good at semantics, I'm not very good at linguistics, but I believe that Simon made a profession or a pretense of converting to Jesus Christ. He, he, he just wanted to join the church in order to recover some of the influence that he'd lost. So he converted and he baptized, but it was all a pretense. He was not sincere in what he was doing. Now, Philip didn't understand that. Because notice what it says there in that verse. It says that Philip himself believed and also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. That word continues is an interesting word because it means he clung to Philip. He stuck to Philip. Just like a stamp to an envelope. This means that everywhere that Philip went, Simon was sure to go. <laughs> he became his traveling companion. And Philip would take him and exhibit him as his star convert. Why, Simon would have been on PTL and would have been on 700 Club, would have been on, on uh, Trinity Broadcasting like that within a week after his conversion and baptism. And here was a sorcerer that had, had such a tremendous influence over a city and over an area, and he would say, well, we've got to get him on that show, you know. What, I, the Spirit of God made me realize when I studied this passage that Philip was grooming Simon to become the pastor of the church of Samaria. See, Philip was an itinerant ministry. He was transient. He was on his way through Samaria. And if you read the rest of the chapter, you will find that soon after these events, the Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, told Philip to get out of Samaria and go down to the desert, go down to the wilderness. So Philip knew that he was going to have to train somebody or groom somebody to take over, to take his place. And who better than Simon? He said, I came with the, I, I'm here to receive, not to give. If Brother Glenn and Sister Irma would have just ignored me, I would have been just as happy. Hmm? If they hadn't given me an, uh, an opportunity to give a report or, or, or preach a message, I would have been just, I would have stayed as long as I planned to stay. Huh? All that hassle of wanting to minister has gone out of me. Huh? I appreciate a few days when I don't have to even do anything. I mean, not very often. When I was younger, I was highly incensed and offended if I was ignored. You know, I, I thought I was the great man of faith and power, and everybody had to take me into consideration. You know, they had to give me preference uh, when it came to ministry. But that's, that's come to an end. I've learned to submit. I believe in mutual submit, submission. The Bible says, submit yourselves one to another. It's not that pyramid, pyramid scheme where everybody submits to one man. Well, there's no place for popish authority in the body of Christ. Uh, but there is place for true spiritual authority. I hope and pray that God will give you an understanding of this. An understanding of this. Okay? Let's go back to Acts. How many still want to study the Word? Do you think this is profitable? Okay. Now, I said that Philip was a great man. He was humble. He was submissive. But he lacked. He lacked certain things. The first thing he lacked, I'm going to share with you, is he lacked spiritual discernment. He lacked spiritual discernment. Do you remember that character called Simon? Magician, sorcerer? When he saw that he was losing his influence over the people of Samaria, what did he do? If you can't beat them, join them. So he decided to jump on the bandwagon and become a Christian. And you'll notice here in verse 12, it says, I mean, verse 13, Then Simon himself believed also. I believe, I, I can't explain, I'm not very good at semantics, I'm not very good at linguistics, but I believe that Simon made a profession or a pretense of converting to Jesus Christ. I don't think he ever became a Christian. He, he, he just wanted to join the church in order to recover some of the influence that he'd lost. So he converted and he baptized, but it was all a pretense. He was not sincere in what he was doing. Now, Philip didn't understand that. Because notice what it says there in that verse. It says 
that Philip himself believed and also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. That word continue is an interesting word because it means he clung to Philip. He stuck to Philip, just like a stamp to an envelope. This means that everywhere that Philip went, Simon was sure to go. <laughs> he became his traveling companion. It, Philip would take him and exhibit him as his star convert. Why, Simon would have been on PTL and would have been on 700 Club, would have been on, on uh, Trinity Broadcasting like that within a week after his conversion and baptism. And here was a, a sorcerer that had, had such a tremendous influence over a city and over an area, and he would say, well, we've got to get him on that show, you know. What, uh, the Spirit of God made me realize when I studied this passage that Philip was grooming Simon to become the pastor of the church at Samaria. See, Philip was an itinerant ministry. He was transient. He was on his way through Samaria. And if you read the rest of the chapter, you will find that soon after these events, the Spirit of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, told Philip to get out of Samaria and go down to the desert, go down to the wilderness. So Philip knew that he was going to have to train somebody or groom somebody to take over, to take his place. And who better than Simon? He seemed to be the most qualified individual in town. He, he, he had personality. He had ability. Uh, he, he had been a leader in the community. Everybody believed he was the great power of God. So he said, I'm going to take this man and train this man. Simon continued with Philip. What would have happened to the church at Samaria if, if Simon had taken over after Philip's departure? It would have been, uh, it would have been disaster because he would have amalgamated his spiritualistic teachings with the Christian teachings. Huh? He would have made, it would have been a hodgepodge religion. Huh? Half Christian and half spiritualistic. Now, God wasn't going to tolerate that situation. See, Philip didn't have discerning of spirits. That's what I'm convinced of. This is a gift. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me tell you something, brethren. Discerning of spirits is not only to discern demons. It's to discern spirit, spirits. There's three kinds of spirits. There are human spirits, evil spirits, and divine spirits. You might be surprised that I say divine spirits. Uh, I believe that apart from the Holy Spirit, which is divine, which is uh, part of the triune God, uh, I believe there are other created spirits that God has placed at the disposal of his people. They're ministering spirits. Not only angels and archangels, not only cherub and Seraphim, I believe there are other, there's another category of spirits that are called just spirits of God. How many have read about the seven spirits of God that are before the throne? Or the seven spirits of God that are sent throughout the earth? You know, every theological book that I've ever read, when it <coughs> talks about the seven spirits of God, it says it's the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that's true. I believe they are seven spirits. I don't think God minces his words. I mean, God can say things plainly. He says seven spirits. And there might be two groupings. Seven before the throne, seven throughout the earth. They're spirits, plural. How many have read about the spirit of wisdom? Huh? Or how many have read about the spirit of might? Or how many have read about the spirit of... Uh... Oh, there's so many. There's 20-some that are mentioned by name in the Bible. See, let me just show you that... Apart from the Holy Spirit, there are many ministering spirits. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. How many know that the church at Ephesus was born of the Spirit and was filled of the Spirit? When Paul came to Ephesus, he found a group of believers that had been converted, that had been regenerated. But he asked them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said, no, we haven't even heard. No one's ever told us. No one's ever taught us about the Holy Spirit. So Paul set about to correct that deficiency. He, he taught them, he baptized them, and then he ministered to them by the laying on of hands. And they received the Holy Ghost. And I believe the church of Ephesus became the most, the, 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 the most spiritual of all churches in the New Testament order. It was outstanding, spiritually speaking. It had gifts and manifestations of the Spirit. Yet, just read what it says here in Ephesians chapter 1, and these things might be new to, and foreign to you, but just take them and consider them. Let the Holy Spirit... Uh, confirm them to you. And here in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and in verse uh, 13, it says that they had been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay? They were not only reborn and filled, but even what? 
sealed with the Holy Spirit. But then Paul begins to say in verse um, uh, 15 and 16 that he was praying for the church at Ephesus. I cease not to give thanks. Uh, I make mention of you in my prayers. Now, what was he praying for? Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you what? The Spirit of revelation and wisdom. Now, they had the Holy Spirit. They had been baptized. They had been anointed. They had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul says, I'm praying that God will give you something additional, that God will give you the spirit of wisdom, of revelation for the knowledge of Him, so that you can give greater insight into the Word of God, so that you can discover many of things that cannot be known except by divine revelation. Now, is he praying that God would give them the Holy Spirit? They already had the Holy Spirit in superabundance, reborn, filled, anointed, sealed. And yet, Paul says, I'm praying that God will give you the spirit of wisdom, spirit of revelation. See, there are many, many spirits of God that are mentioned by name in the Bible. They're created spirits. God has created them to benefit his people. They have a particular or peculiar minister, ministry to, uh, in the body of Christ today. They assist us. They strengthen us. Uh, many times, when, uh, when we feel something come over us, we think, well, it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It could be something else. It could be uh, the presence of an angel. It could be the presence of a Spirit of God. <clears throat> it could be a ministering Spirit that God has sent to protect us or to guide us or to instruct us or to strengthen us. We know so little about these things. We're ignorant. Even most Charismatics, most Pentecostals don't know a thing about this, these beings called the angels of God or the spirits of God. Amen? Yeah. Now, the gift of discerning of spirits is to be able to discern what spirit is operating. If it's the human spirit or the divine spirit or the evil spirit. And we're taken up many times by spiritual manifestation. Everything that shines isn't gold. Not all spiritual manifestations are, are, are godly. Satan is a master counterfeiter. He transforms himself into an angel of light. He can counterfeit all the gifts, all the ministries, all the manifestations. How many have heard false tongues and false prophecies? The Bible talks about all kinds of false ministries, false prophets, false apostles, false, false teachers. The Bible talks about miracles, lying wonders. Satan is a master counterfeiter, and he can counterfeit any gift, any manifestation. What are we supposed to do then, according to 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 4? Believe not every spirit, but what? Try. Try. We've got to examine, we've got to test, we've got to set them to the test to see if they are of God or not of God. See? Not every spirit is the spirit of God. There are many other created beings that we need to discern. We can be so easily fooled. We can be so easily deceived. We can be led astray by spiritual manifestation. And let me tell you something today, brethren. Charismatic people, Pentecostal people at large are very gullible. They go for any spiritual manifestation, anything that looks good or feels good, they attribute it to God. There's a lot of foolishness being carried on in the body of Christ now. I could go into several manifestations that I've seen around the country that I believe are demonic, and I don't have time to do that this morning. Huh? And you have to be on your guard. I don't think you have to be fearful, but you have to be cautious. Right. Don't get swallowed up by spiritual manifestations. Don't get bowled over by them. Don't be, become awed and, and astonished by what's going on. Boy, right. oh, it's quiet here this morning. <laughs> See, we need discerning of spirits. You remember when Paul went to, let's go to the book of Acts, in chapter, I think it's 14... No, it's, uh, where did I see that here? It must be in chapter 14. Chapter 14, yes. He went down to uh, uh, Lystra and the Derby, and there he found a man, according to verse 8, that was impotent. He was, he was crippled up. He, he, he was lame. He couldn't walk. He couldn't jump. He couldn't run. Now, notice what it says here in uh, chapter 14, verse 9. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. What did, what did this man have? Paul perceived, discerned that he had what? Faith. And you know that faith is the Spirit of God? Huh? Second Corinthians, uh, hey Lord, help me find that verse. 
uh, in my old Bible, I have everything marked, but uh, today I'm being, having to use my memory. Uh, here in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 4.13, it says, We having the same spirit of faith. Spirit of faith. You know, faith can be many things. It can be, there, the Bible talks about a measure of faith. The Bible talks about the gift of faith. The Bible talks about the fruit of faith. But here the Bible talks about the spirit of faith. Now, there's different kinds of faith. And I believe that there is a spirit of God called the spirit of faith that will minister to you and be a supernatural kind of faith. A faith that produces signs and wonders and miracles. And the Bible says that Paul gazed upon this man and he discerned in the spirit that this man had faith, had the spirit of faith, that the spirit of faith was operating in this man. And he said, rise up and walk. And like that, the man reacted to the voice and to the spirit. And the man walked in this, turned the town upside down. Everybody went into a frenzy. They wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. They wanted to celebrate a heathen feast in their honor. Now, what did Paul have? He had discerning of spirits. He had discerning of spirits. But listen to this. It not always worked. See, the gifts of the Spirit don't work when you want them to work. They work when God wants them to work. And I think some people have abused the gifts, trying to exercise the gift when it's not it hasn't been quickened or it hasn't been activated by the Holy Spirit. You remember in, in Acts 16, verse 14, 16, 18, 20, Paul was in Philippi, and as he was ministering in that city, there was no synagogue, there was no temple, so he and the believers would meet down by the riverside. They'd have an afternoon prayer meeting. And when he began to walk through the streets of the city on his way to the river, a little damsel, a girl in her teens, began to follow him. And what did she, what did she say? With a loud voice, she would cry out and, and say, These men are the servants of the Most High God that have come to announce the way of salvation. And Paul at first was pleased. Huh? Free propaganda, you know. He had his, this girl was following him every day, same hour, uh, publicizing his ministry. But the Bible says that little by little, Paul began to feel a check in his spirit. He was troubled. There was something about the girl and her, her manners or the girl and her, and her voice that begin to bounce off of his spirit. He felt re a revolt. He felt a rejection in his spirit. What was this? The gift of discerning of spirits. But it took Paul several days to discern that the spirit that was operating in this girl was not a spirit of God, but was a spirit of divination. We need discernment in these end times, brethren. Because the enemy today is working with such subtlety, huh? with such... Uh, astuteness, that unless we can discern in the Spirit, we are going to also uh, be deceived, like so many others have been deceived. There's a lot of people that think they've gone into higher realms of the Spirit, into higher flights and higher dimensions of the Spirit that are being swept off their feet. They're in deception. There's a lot of teaching going around this country that seems very good and palatable, but it's damnable. It's being spawned in the pit. And unless we have discerning of spirit, we're going to be swallowed up by that teaching. And before long, our testimony and our ministry will be completely useless. We will be looked on as some kind of crackpots, religious crackpots, and there's a lot of those around the country. Huh? Extremists, fanatics, because we've gotten involved in some experience or in some doctrine that is not of God. Amen? Now, Philip didn't have discerning of spirits. And he was impressed by Simon. He accepted Simon's profession or conversion. Now, he even baptized them. He even began to train them and groom them for ministry. You know, if, you know, Philip knew his limitations. I think that's why he sent a report to Jerusalem. It was a cry for help. He, he, he probably told the Apostle of Jerusalem, please send somebody to come and assist me or come and, and help me because uh, this thing's getting too big for me. You know, I don't know what to do. The Bible says that when Peter and John came down, they, by the Spirit, were able to unmask or to denounce this man. Huh? How do we know that? Let's go back to Acts 8. Verse 23, For I perceive, let's talk about spiritual insight and spiritual discernment, for I perceive that thou art in what? The gall of bitterness and in the bond, bond of iniquity. This man was bitter because he had lost his trade. 
He was bitter because Philip had come and put him out of business. But he knew how to cover it up. He knew how to disguise his bitterness. There was a root of bitterness that was festering in his soul. He had a spirit of bitterness that had him in bondage. He was in a prison house, a spiritual prison house, a bond of iniquity. Now, who discovered this? Philip? No, Philip didn't. Peter did. And let me tell you, brethren, on the basis of the Word of God, we need each other. You don't have everything that it's going to take to survive in these end times. And if you isolate yourself, and you're off in a little corner by yourself, acting super spiritual, boy, you're headed for trouble. You're headed for trouble. Many people say, well, I, in my community, I don't, there's not a church that I can attend. You know? Because there's no church that believes just like you believe. Well, you know what I, my advice to people like that is? Find the best church you can in the community and identify with it. They might not believe in some of your pet doctrines. They might not believe in deliverance. They might not believe in sonship. They might not believe in kingdom. They might not believe in dominion. They might not believe in identity. Who cares? They, but if it's a sound Bible-believing church where they preach the new birth and where they preach the, the healing and preach the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they preach some of the, the, the fundamentals of, of, uh, of the Bible, you better identify with that church. And if you are cautious and you are wise, you can be used of God to lead the people in to other revelation and experience in God. Amen? Amen? But if you go there in the first week, you're trying to jam your beliefs down the throat of the pastor and some of the members and some of the elders, they're going to give you the boot. I mean, they're going to throw you out of that church. Amen. You have to go and learn to love the people and respect the people and draw from them and minister when you can, not impose your views on others. Now, this is not compromise, brethren. This is not compromise. Uh, we need to identify locally with the body of Christ. Even if they don't have everything that we believe they should have. And I know people that come to this camp and to other camps around the country that all, they're, they're feeding just on uh, books and on tapes. And that's wonderful. But, brethren, the local church needs you. Needs your support. They need... Your presence there. Huh? They need you to attend, and they need you to pray, and they need you to finance that operation. How many agree with me? Amen. Oh, just a handful. Boy, I, Brother Glenn, I don't think I'm going to get invited back here. They got nothing to do with it. Oh, they have nothing to do with it. <laughs> Brother, I'm, I'm talking out of experience, long experience. Amen. And I've seen so many Christians that have had have made shipwreck for isolating themselves from the body of Christ. No church is perfect. You're not going to find a perfect church anywhere. And if you find a perfect church and you join it, you're going to ruin it. Because the church is the sum total of its members. And if the church is perfect when you arrive, when you land, whoa, woe to that church. Because you're going to mess up that perfection. How many of you here today think you're perfect? And how in the world do you expect the local church to be perfect? Well, God, bless God, He's led you on into other truth. And I'm not denying the truth that you've come into. But brethren, be patient with the others. Now, God will bring them along. He, you might be the instrument that God's going to use to bring those people along. But you have to be very wise and very careful. When, when, when I install pastors in, in, on the mission field, I say, don't upset the apple cart. For the first, second year, don't try to change anything. You need to gain the respect and the love of the people. Serve them. Serve them with humility. Meet their spiritual needs. And after a year or two, the Spirit of God is going to direct you to bring about certain changes in the procedures, in the programs, He's going, to, he's going to use you. By then, people will trust you and people will obey you. But if you come in like a bull in a china cabinet and try to change everything around, re rearrange everything, uh, the church is going to dismiss you. Right. And I think that's what's happened with many of us that have been excommunicated out of churches is because we go in and we try to impose ourselves on people. But instead of sitting quietly and humbly, waiting on God, waiting till God opens the door where we can suggest where we can uh, uh, when where we can minister uh, where we will become effective members of that local body 
Okay? Philip didn't have discernment. I believe that if Peter hadn't come down, that church would have been wrecked sooner or later. Amen? Amen. Now, when Peter and John came down, uh, I'm, I wouldn't doubt, if we would have been in Philip's place, we would have said, listen to you boys, <laughs> I don't want you coming barging in on my revival. <laughs> I've, take, I've taken the, the heat of the day. I took the brunt of the persecution. I had to suffer and sacrifice to get this thing going. And now you guys come in at the tail end and you want to take my revival over. If you want to have a revival, go down to some town uh, in, Ju in Judea or in Galilee and, and you go and preach up a storm and, and if the God's with you, you're going to have a revival as, as good or even better than I have here. You know, that would be selfishness. But there's a lot of selfish ministers out there that don't want to avail themselves of what other ministries have to offer. They want to lord it over the body of Christ. And they won't bring anybody in that would pose a threat to them. And they won't let anybody arise within the congregation that will, they suspect will maybe rivalize them. Oh, Philip was humble. I think he rejoiced when Peter and John arrived. And he let these men who were apostles take the initiative. <coughs> And it was Peter that denounced Simon and said, Thy money perish with thee. What Peter was saying, you're a lost man. You're, you're, you're damned. You're on your way to perdition. You're on your way to destruction. You have never repented. You have never changed your life and never changed your, your beliefs. Thy money perish with thee. Now, the second thing that Philip was lacking was spiritual authority. Not only spiritual discernment, but spiritual authority. You know... Spiritual authority operates in different ways. But I just want you to read here with me in Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and re they received the Holy Ghost. And when F Simon saw that through the, laying on of hands of, uh, through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power. Now, the word power there is not the word... And I pronounce it dunamis, but a brother yesterday correctly said it was something like thinamin or something like that. I'm not a linguist, so forgive me. It's not the word dunamis, it's the word exousia. It's not talking about a dynamic power, it's talking about a legal power. It's the word authority. It's legal authority. It's, it's the power of eternity. It's a legal right that is being conferred to you to represent an individual or to represent a company. For example, when I left Guatemala, I had, uh, the week before I had had a very serious accident in El Salvador... Some of you received the letter that I sent through the mail describing this accident. And my car, the van that I used, was in Hawk. Uh, the, the, the police had kept the car, and I knew that I'd be away four or five weeks. So I went to a lawyer, made a power of attorney, signed my, uh, my, uh, over to my son the right to represent me in this case and in other cases. This power of attorney had to take, be taken to the general attorney, it had to be taken to the secretary of uh, foreign relations, it had to be notarized several times before it was accepted by the courts in El Salvador. My son, with that document, went to El Salvador and got the car back, huh? because he went representing me. He, he, he was acting on my advice, he was acting with my authority. So he, actually, the courts in El Salvador recognized him uh, as my uh, personal and legal representative. And by, this is the meaning of the word power here. It's the power of eternity, of attorney. See, Philip had led the people into salvation, into water baptism, into deliverance, into healing, but not one single person in Samaria had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Probably he didn't have the knowledge or the courage to minister the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the people. No, we, we all have ministries. I, I know some people that are excellent in leading people into deliverance that don't know how to minister the Holy Spirit after people have been delivered. They have to call on somebody else, come and pray with me so that this person can be filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit. See? Now, what would have happened if Philip had not permitted Peter and John to come down and minister? Uh, the spiritual growth of the church at Samaria would have been stunted. They were saved, baptized, healed, delivered but they would have never had the infilling of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. They would have been powerless. They wouldn't have been equipped for ministry. They wouldn't have been equipped for testimony. 
They wouldn't have had that supernatural endowment of spiritual power that would have made them victorious and effective in Christian ministry. Amen? What did they lack? What did Philip lack? Authority to minister the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, brethren, God has given to us different gifts severally as He wills. And let me once again state the fact that none of us have it all cornered. You have certain abilities, I have certain abilities. You have certain gifts, I have certain gifts. But we must supplement each other. We need each other. One of the reasons why our ministry in Latin America has grown is because we have availed ourselves of other ministries. God sends other ministries through Guatemala and through the other countries. And they might be from a different denominational background than ours. They might be even not agree with us entirely in certain doctrinal issues. But I see the signs of, of the anointing. I see, I discern that they are true men and women of God. And we give them an opportunity to share and give them an opportunity to minister. And I tell you, brethren, they've been an immense blessing to our work. Because they have led our people into areas of worship and ministry and warfare that probably we would have never been able to. We are all limited. How many recognize your limitations? The only one that's not limited is God. Huh? We are straightened within ourselves. Only God has all the ingredients we need for successful ministry. But he doesn't give these ingredients to one man. Because that man would become infallible. He would become, get to the place where he would feel that he doesn't need anybody else. That he can do it all. That's the, the mistake many pastors have made right here in America. Huh? They become dictators. And they won't let anybody rise up and share and minister because they feel threatened by it. And the church stays in a babyhood state. Never grows, develops, matures because it's not getting any outside ministry. Listen, any pastor that closes the doors to outside ministry is in for a shocking discovery. The work will corrupt. It becomes ingrown. You know the difference between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea? Huh? The Dead Sea, the water stagnated. And the water's polluted. And it breeds death. You won't even find tadpoles in the Dead Sea. Huh? That's what happens in a church or a ministry that doesn't bring in outside ministry. Uh, to supplement what God has given locally. Now, Philip was wise. He let Peter and, and John come and minister in, in, in his area of need, he, they ministered the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They prayed for the people that they might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They prayed and they acted because they laid hands on the people. And something obviously happened because the Bible says that Simon saw that by the laying on the hands of the apostles, they received the Holy Ghost. It was visible to, uh, to the eye. And I believe they, what he saw was, uh, he saw them singing and praising in other tongues. Huh? Speaking in other tongues under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, brethren, what the lesson that God wants to bring us today is that we should not stand alone. Amen. We're coming into a very dangerous period in history, what has been called the end times. And you know what the devil is doing today is trying to, to build, we, uh, uh, not bridges, but wedges amongst God's people. I mean, I'm frightened when I see the deliverance people can't get along with each other. Huh? Sonship people can't get along with each other. When I travel around this country, people just badmouth other ministries. Huh? We don't see the abilities. We see the defects of other ministries. Huh? You know, I, I'm in a very difficult position as a missionary because as a missionary, I go to well, any church that invites me to come and, and share. I'm in denominational, non-denominational churches. I get into fundamental churches into holiness churches, into Pentecostal churches, into charismatic churches, sonship churches, deliverance churches, New Testament order churches, all kinds, all sh shapes. But you know what happens? If you go and minister in that man's church, forget. Forget me. Forget about ministering in my church. And they put me on the spot. And I've had to make choices. And I don't like to have to make choices sometimes. Huh? They say, if you associate with people that believe such and such doctrine, you're finished with us. You know, 
Let me give you one word of advice. Our fellowship is not around a doctrine. It's around a person called Jesus Christ. Doctrines divide. Christ unites. I think we can fellowship around Jesus in spite of our doctrinal differences. If we agree on the fundamentals, if we agree on the essentials, that should be enough. Old Count Sinzendorf, the founder of the Moravian Church, had a saying, and perhaps that's the only thing I can remember about the man. He said, in things essential, unity. In things non-essential, liberty. But in all things, charity. Huh? If we can agree on things that are essential, uh, and, and we can fellowship around the person of Jesus Christ, let have a, let's have a spirit of tolerance and a, speed of, a spirit of meekness towards other people that disagree with us. Over and above everything else, let's love each other. Huh? Let's love the brethren and let's try to honor the brethren. Let's try to promote the brethren. And let's not tear them down and rip them apart and let's not stamp upon them. Let's not join the enemy in destroying other people's reputations, other people's ministries. Amen? Yes. Amen. We should have a... I admire Philip. You know, I chose to minister on Acts 8 purposely because we hear a lot about Peter. We hear a lot about Paul. But how many times we ignore other New Testament characters that have so much to teach us? This man is one of my favorite New Testament personages because he has such admirable qualities. Huh? He knew how to respect. He knew to, how to obey. He knew how to honor other ministries. And I believe that this is the will of God for us today. Huh? God wants us to learn that other people have much to share and much to teach. We, we don't have to be swallowed. How do you say it? Line, foot, huh? Line, hook, hook and sinker. Huh? We, we, we can examine, we can evaluate. Uh, we, 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 when we come in contact with new teaching, what we have to do is what we do when we eat fish. We eat the meat and throw away the, the bones. Huh? I believe that the Lord has spoken to us this morning. How many believe that God has said something to you that will help you in your own personal life and ministry from now on? Let's stand and thank God for that. Just raise your hands. And if there's some lesson you have learned, thank God for that. Perhaps you haven't agreed with everything that I've said. That doesn't matter. But if the Lord has spoken to you about some matter of importance, say, Lord, I thank you for illuminating me. I thank you for directing me. I thank you for showing me the truth about myself, about my home, about my ministry. Let's learn these lessons and let's apply these lessons to our daily life. Now, Father, we thank you this morning because by your word and by you, your spirit you have spoken to us. We ask you to impregnate our spirit with your living truth. That your truth will be a light in the midst of darkness that will guide our steps and guide our words so that we will not err or fail. Lord, let us teach us to have appreciation for the body of Christ. For other men that have different ministries and have different beliefs, but that are true servants and true soldiers of the cross of Jesus Christ. That we will not join the crowd that is trying to discredit and destroy ministries but that we will recognize them and, and as best we can protect them uh, from uh, the mouths and from the eyes of those that hate the body of Jesus Christ. Give us a humble and meek spirit. Help us to submit to those that you have placed in leadership and in authority in your church. And that we will flow together in a spirit of unity, in a spirit of love, in a spirit of understanding, in a spirit of cordi cordiality that we will flow together as one body, getting ready, Lord, for the things that surely will come, getting ready for these dreadful days that lie ahead. Lord, help us to draw strength from each other and draw advice from each other so that we can be faithful to Jesus Christ in the midst of tribulation. We bless you. We thank you. We praise you today. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and 
lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.